this is Dr. Halisa Elwine. Welcome back to our study in Workbook 2 of the Creation Gospel, which is the Seven Abominations of the Wicked Lamb. We're continuing our study. We're almost to the seals, almost there. We've just laid this foundation here of, of preparation as to what exactly is going on in, in Revelation in general. Why this description? Why all these judgments? What's Revelation about? Well, ultimately it's about Shabbat. And we've been discussing the garments of Shabbat because two of the, the assemblies of Revelation, Sardis and Laodicea, they were both warned they needed to keep their garments. They needed to check their garments that they were not soiled. And so that takes us to the prophet Zechariah, or Zechariah. In chapter 3, verse 3, we have a description of someone named Yehoshua in Hebrew, very close to Yeshua. They've got the, the same uh, root verb there. But this description of Yehoshua, or Joshua, I think can give us some insight into the garments so that we can wrap up this discussion of keeping our garments and the warning that we're receiving concerning our garments. And then we can start to move into those seals and try to examine what happens when each of those seals cracks open. So in Zechariah 3, verse 3, it says, Now Joshua, Yehoshua, was clothed in filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with change of raiment. Sounds like King James, doesn't it? But here's a pattern that we can see in this discussion of Joshua, or Yehoshua. Um, Yeshua took on mortality. In order to do the work that he needed to do for us to be able to change our garments, he had to take on mortality. And so he was born to his father's people. He was born to Israel. And we can see in Joshua or Yehoshua what happened to them in exile. In fact, it had begun even before the exile, which is why there was an exile. They had soiled their garments with idolatry. They allowed the idolatry of the nations to contaminate not just the land of Israel itself or Judah itself, but contaminated the very Temple Mount itself. And so they're sent into exile in Babylon. They're sent into captivity. And while they're there, there's even more. Uh, exposure to the unclean things of the world that could soil their garments. And so they're coming back now. They're coming back to rebuild Jerusalem. They're coming back to rebuild the temple. And they need cleansing. They need a return to Shabbat. Because remember, Shabbat really is the axis of what's happening in the book of Revelation. It's how you treat Shabbat. And it's it's going to be determined by what's going on inside of you, not necessarily what's outside of you, but what's going on inside. And so the Jews are returning to Jerusalem, and in that return, they also need a return to purity. They need a return to this, this grand time, space of time called Shabbat. Because if you can get things in order, on Shabbat, it seems like everything else just starts falling into place. But that's where you start. You start with Shabbat. And in the time of Nehemiah, the, the time period here where Zechariah would be talking about, Nehemiah, who's a prophet, he comes back and he's there to lead with this process of cleansing the temple, the process of rebuilding the walls and the gates of Jerusalem. And he has a problem. As he's trying to rebuild, as he's trying to restore the, the purity, 
as he's trying to re-prepare the Jews for the, the, the temple itself to begin functioning properly the way it's supposed to, he realizes he has a huge Shabbat problem. And if you have a huge Shabbat problem, eventually you'll have a huge everything else problem. And Nehemiah has to address this huge Shabbat problem. The problem he's having is that merchants are bringing goods, whether it's just products or whether it's even food like fish, they're bringing those things into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And they're buying and they're selling, they're conducting commercial activity on the Sabbath day in the holy city. And what makes it worse is that the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the Jews of Jerusalem, are engaging this. See, if you don't buy, pretty soon the merchants go away. And that's what we need in this world. We need more people who don't buy on Shabbat so that businesses will begin to close on Saturday. That would be awesome, wouldn't it? But this is Nehemiah's problem. How to prevent this impurity from being introduced not just into the city of Jerusalem, but in, into the focal point of its worship, which is the Shabbat. And so his solution, it was to close the gates of the city and to set the Levites as guards. And then he threatens the people trying to keep getting in. He's like, I'll pull your beard out. I'll do something. I'll do something horrible to you if you do not stop trying to introduce commercial activity into the holy city on Shabbat. They're trying to soil the garments of Jerusalem. They're trying to soil the garments that they wear on Shabbat. And so we have this prophecy here of Joshua, Yehoshua, as kind of a, a prophetic shadow of Yeshua, demonstrating the type of priest that Yeshua would be. And in the time of Yeshua, it's not going to be like in the time of Nehemiah. Jerusalem is not even going to need to close the gates, much less bar the gates, because something is going to have happened to Israel. Something is going to have happened to Jerusalem. They are going to have that heart change that we're talking about. And you can leave the gates of the city wide open. It wouldn't matter if, you know, semi-trucks rolled in selling Mercedes for two cents out of the back end, nobody would buy it. It's Shabbat. That's not what we do on Shabbat. And so in the time of Messiah, in the kingdom of Messiah, you don't have to close and bar the doors of Jerusalem because the people have changed. They have exchanged their soiled garments for pure garments. And there's no need. It says that the gates will be open day and night because no one inside is even going to dream of appearing naked or soiled in the holy city. And when those gates are left open, when there has been such a transformation inside the inhabitants of Jerusalem, then we're also told that the kings of the earth will bring their glory into the holy city. Now that's a big switch. Whereas before, and again, you have to think of another part of the book of Revelation, this long list of cargoes that have been cut off and the merchants of the earth are lamenting, Babylon the Great has fallen, fallen. All those cargoes, all that merchandise that people craved and, and bought and sold and, and was the, you know, brought about the death of many souls. Because remember the last cargo in the list, human souls. It's human souls that were sacrificed for the sake of this commerce. And so now we don't have to worry about the merchants of the earth trying to introduce products and so forth, commercial products into the holy city on Shabbat. Now it says the kings of the earth will bring their glory into the holy city. Glory is kavod, honor, 
radiance. That's what's going to be coming into the holy city. And in fact, if, if you have Shabbat products in your home, it might be maybe a challah board, it might be a challah cover, uh, maybe you've got a kiddush cup, um, it might even be on a talit. It can be on different Shabbat-oriented products, but you might see a phrase in Hebrew. And if you can translate that phrase in Hebrew, what it might be saying is, likvod Shabbat Kodesh. Likvod Shabbat Kodesh. And what that would translate to in English is to the glory or for the glory of the Holy Sabbath. And that's the message that we're getting in the, the renewed um, Jerusalem is that yes, the gates can be left open you don't have to worry about commerce coming in and out on the Holy Shabbat and diminishing the glory, diminishing the honor of Jerusalem, diminishing the name of the Holy One in the earth. Instead, it says the kings of the earth will bring their honor into it. If there's any honor among the nations, they are going to bring their good things to share on Shabbat not for sale. They're simply bringing the honor into the holy city. And that's what mankind was created to do. If there is any honor, if there is any glory of yours, then you bring it into the holy city. You become part of that congregation of the holy city and your honor becomes part of the honor of all the people around you, which is to bring ultimate honor to the king of the Sabbath. And so just as we dedicate certain objects to the Shabbat, like say it might be your challah board, it might be your kiddush cup, um, it might be a special mat where you put things out on the, on the counter, you have special objects in your house that are completely dedicated to Shabbat because you want to dedicate any honor that you might have any good thing that you might have, you want to set it aside. And on the Sabbath day, you want to bring that honor into the holy day. And then you start connecting with other people who do the same. And all of a sudden, it's like it says the lamp is the lamb. In Jerusalem, the radiance or the glory of those who celebrate the Shabbat in holiness is going to be part of that light of Jerusalem. And so this is a way when we bring our honor in to honor the king, then we want to be wearing those sparkling Shabbat garments. In fact, if that's your goal, if that's, I want to bring any honor that I have, any dedicated thing of mine, I want to bring it in for the glory of the king, then it sounds like you've already put on those sparkling garments. You're already commemorating the work of creation and remembering the glory of the Creator. And so it says, even the kings of the nations, the leaders of the nations, whatever honor they have, whatever they have prepared to increase the glory of the holy city, they will, the gates will be open and they will be allowed to bring those dedicated things, not to sell or barter, but instead to bring as gifts for the benefit of all in the holy city because this brings honor to the king. Remember the seventh abomination? Separate brothers. The whole goal of the seventh day, the seventh feast, the seventh spirit, the Shabbat, is to bring brothers together. Human beings were created with an intrinsic dignity. There is the spark of the divine in them. They are made in the image of Elohim. And so in every human being, there's, there's a, a bit of his honor. And when those human beings obey him, when they keep their garments, and instead of buying and selling to improve their own positions, 
Instead, they obey the commandment of Shabbat and they bring all this which is dedicated to him together into the holy city. Instead of separating out brothers, which is the seventh abomination, you have a true Sabbath day in which not only is the lamp the lamb, but the honor of the nations will be brought into this place and become part of that light. Um, Israel will be a light to the nations and then the nations will bring whatever they have in for the benefit of the holy city. And so whether they're Jewish or whether they're from the nations obeying this commandment to come in at Shabbat and to worship, you can still say the same thing. Likvod Shabbat Kodesh. This is all for the, the glory, for the honor of the Holy Sabbath. This is what we were created to do. But as we saw in the parable in Matthew twenty-two twelve 12 of, of the guest who was invited in, he had no sense of the glory or the honor of Shabbat. The way that he dressed, and remember, this is not about physical clothes. I mean, it can be, but this has more to do with the betrayal, with the soiling of the garments that were cautioned against in preparation for the kingdom, in preparation for the wedding. And so we, we can sit here and we can just imagine all the honor, all the glory in Messiah's kingdom, when even the, the leaders of the nations are gonna bring all their glory into the holy city. We won't have to worry about buying and selling on Shabbat. That commercialism will cease to interfere. But this wedding guest in Matthew 22, he has taken this invitation lightly. See, it all sounds glorious, but kavod or glory, if the nations are gonna bring their glory into it, to add to the glory of Shabbat, glory is kavod. Heaviness is kaved. And it can be a positive thing, kavod is uh, a positive thing. And we get the, the weight of the glory. That's where we're getting kaved. It's a heaviness, like the priest couldn't stand to minister. But there's a downside to this too. And it has to do with just a heaviness of spirit. Right now we're in a, a plague called COVID-19. COVID would be spelled with the same letters as kaved, which is heaviness. Something that drags you down. It's a heaviness of spirit. It's a dullness. It's a thickness. It's like Pharaoh. It was said that Pharaoh had a livered heart. He had a hard heart. It was livered because kaved can also be the liver. It's the heaviest organ. So that's how it got its name. So we've got the kavod. We've got the glory of his honor, his highness. But then we have the heaviness of someone like Pharaoh or someone like this wedding guest who does not know how to prepare their garments. They're earthbound. They're too heavy. They're too full of their own glory to make room for anyone else. And so it was a high calling to be invited into the wedding. And so he's dressed. He's just not dressed with special clothes. Something about this man was not changed by the invitation. And you think, well, if I didn't, if I wasn't originally invited to this wedding, but there were people who wouldn't show up and therefore I was invited instead, then the honor, the kavod that I feel should bring about a transformation in me. I was not entitled, I was not invited, but now I've got an invitation to the king's table. How should that change my approach? Well, if he thinks about why he's there, because there were people who were invited who were no-shows. In fact, it says some of them even killed the messengers who brought the news of the day of the holy matrimony. And so, not only did they not want to come to the wedding, they wanted to kill anybody who talked about the wedding. 
And so they could have come, but now the invitation has been extended to others who weren't originally invited. And then those who responded were expected to put on proper wedding clothes. It's not a come as you are party. And so what we see is this wedding guest, he declined to change anything about his behavior, either inner or exterior. Because had his inner person changed, it would have been reflected in his garments. See, we're using physical garments as an example, but when we have a transformation of the Holy Spirit, what people see on the outside does change. So we keep going back to the scroll written inside and out. What's on the outside needs to be what's on the inside. But there again, what's on the inside needs to be on the outside. And so when he writes his Torah on our hearts, then our garments do change. What people see in us should change. And so it appears that these other guests who were maybe second choices, they weren't the original choices, but they responded. They were transformed somehow by the invitation. And in that transformation, they began to change their garments. They began to wash their garments. They began to acquire garments worthy of the wedding. They began to put on garments that reflected the honor of the invitation. Their garments reflected the honor of the king who invited them. And so that's a message to us. If we've received an invitation to the wedding, it helps us to, to find out who we are in Messiah. I can be at the wedding. I can be restored to the garden. I can become part of a royal priesthood. And once you know who you are, everything changes. You're not insecure. You have more confidence. And that confidence begins to transform itself into greater and greater obedience because you realize what a wonderful thing that I even received the invitation. And we start to learn to make distinctions between what is clean and unclean. Oh, that's not something I would want to take into the palace of the king. Oh, that, that's really nothing I would want to drag in there. Oh, I would never want the king to see me like that. And we begin to change. We begin to prepare for that holy day. And that holy day is not going to be just like any other day. It's going to be a special day, a special day of honor, a day when the gates are open. And so I should never bring anything abominable or unclean to the holy table on Shabbat. This invitation is issued by the King of Glory himself. And so we get a commandment concerning beasts. Not only are human beings supposed to rest on the Sabbath day, it says you're beasts too. Let them rest. That's not their work day. And that tells us that we need to resume our place as rulers of the creation. Our behavior needs to reflect who Yeshua is restoring us to be. And if he's restoring us and preparing us to go back to work in the garden, that means we're going to have to go back to work ruling over the animals for their good. It's a benevolent rulership, but without us there to tell the animals no more working and to quit working them. The animals aren't wired to do that or to know that. We as the ruler, we're given that special obligation to make sure even the beasts are going to rest on the Sabbath day. That's what's so incredible about Jonah taking the gospel or taking the message of repentance to Nineveh is that the king made sure that even the beast repented in sackcloth and ashes. <laughs> That's a commitment to a holy day right there. We don't want to conform ourselves to the image of the beast who doesn't know one day from the other. 
We want to conform ourselves to the image of Elohim who does know one day from another. He rested on the Shabbat day and we should too. We should be transformed by this invitation to the Shabbat. We should be transformed by the one who issued the invitation. And so that, that picture there of Yehoshua or Joshua showing us the change of the filthy garments and how Jerusalem has to transform. The Sabbath is going to be the sign of that transformation. It's how you deal with the Sabbath that really tells the whole story. We can't take lightly the one who sent Yeshua, anointed Yeshua, resurrected Yeshua, and gave him a rod of authority over the nations. We have to respect where that invitation was issued from and from whom it was issued. His honor. And we only want to bring honorable things into the holy city. We only want to bring honorable things to a holy table of Shabbat. So checking our pockets, this is a, a, a statute of Judaism. Check your pockets before Shabbat to make sure there's nothing in your pockets that you don't want in there for Shabbat. That's a lesson to us. We need to be checking our pockets in hidden places to make sure that honor is all that we bring to the table in our clothes. These principles were in place even before Yeshua verified them. When he preached and when he taught, he verified this. He uses these parables. He's using the symbols. He's using the language and the understanding of a first century Jew to explain our Sabbath behavior, to explain the clothes that John is later going to warn us about. When he writes these letters to Sardis and Laodicea, it's not without context, it's not without foundation. These are things that were in John's wheelhouse and Yeshua's wheelhouse to begin with. It's part of that Jewish culture of preparation for the Shabbat in the first century. And so we can see in this day and time, we can see a breach is being repaired one of the first things that Christianity lost when it separated from its Jewish brothers, from the Jewish believers, one of the first things they lost was the Shabbat. And when you lose the honor and the glory of Shabbat, when you use that as kind of the, the canary in the coal mine to assess the spiritual condition of the believer, then we lost something very important. We lost a lesson about garments and how we can either choose garments of iniquity or we can choose garments of obedience to the works of Messiah Yeshua. And see, he learned to obey in spite of suffering. And sometimes we may have to suffer in order to be obedient on Shabbat if we follow his example. And it says in Isaiah 59, 6, it's talking about the garments of the wicked lamp. It says, their webs will not become clothing, nor will they cover themselves with their works. Their works are works of iniquity, and an act of violence is in their hands. Their feet run to evil. There's our fifth abomination. And an act of violence is in their hands. There's our hands that shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. That's that heart devising wicked plans. Devastation and destruction are in their highways. So Isaiah is telling us our works are our clothing. It's what you put on. And what you put on is determined by what you have on inside. The abominations of the wicked lamp, they're going to have no place at the king's table, in the king's city, in the king's temple. 
And this is what's happening in Revelation. There is a purging, a cleansing taking place so that those who have been transformed by the invitation can take part. Thank you.